Hey, thanks for joining me for today's podcast. On the show today, I am in conversation with a brilliant writer and journalist called Johan Harry. He is an international best-selling author. I'm a great fan of his work. His previous two books called Chasing the Scream and Lost Connections are brilliant reads. But today, we're in conversation about his latest book out this month called Stolen Focus. His work has been praised by Oprah Winfrey and Joe Rogan, and I understand why when I read his books, and so will you when you read his latest book, Stolen Focus. It's a book about how our focus has been stolen and our attention is being raided by corporations that are doing that for profitable gain, financial profitable gain, and how it's in their vested interest never to lose our focus and never to lose our attention. Johan speaks about how He had the idea for the book, or he was motivated to write the book after an interesting experience he had with his godson at Graceland, Elvis's home in Memphis of all places. Uh, It's a fascinating conversation for a good hour or so, where he spoke about phrases in the book like surveillance capitalism, about our hypervigilance that's been triggered by the uh, theft of our attention and our focus, and what we can do about it and how this is affecting us in ways none of us are fully aware of. It is a brilliant conversation. You're going to love it. Please leave a review or a comment if you enjoyed the show today. If you don't subscribe, think about doing that. Thanks for being here. Enjoy this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. Thanks for being on the show today. Hey, very um, sty- you're a very stylish looking house. I'm always impressed by people who have tidy houses. Yeah, this is my office. We've got a big old farmhouse. So I, I was able oh, to adapt nice. just for my own space and keep it relatively tidy and work on the background looking effective rather than a virtual Zoom background, which can look terrible, as you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It never looks good, does it? Listen, I love the book. Thanks oh. for thanks for bringing this out. I wanted to ask you, I know it seems a simple question, um, but why did you choose to write about this? I'm intrigued by how do you know what to choose to write about at any given time as an author? Because there's a, there's a difference between what you might enjoy and what other people might enjoy reading, right? Because you obviously want people to read the book. So how do you manage that? How did you choose to write about this? Yeah, for me, for all my books, because I spend such a long time on my books, because my method is to travel all over the world and interview people related to the subject in all sorts of different places. For me, there's got to be a question that I want to know the answer to that at the start, I don't right. know the answer to, right? And obviously I have, I don't start as a completely blank slate. I, I've got some ideas. I've got, I've got my own theories, but so with my first book, Chasing the Scream, we'd had a lot of addiction in my family. I wanted to know, well, what causes addiction? Why, why do we go to war against people with addiction when that is such, seems like such a disaster? What right. are the actual alternatives in practice for my book about depression, lost connections, I wanted to understand why are depression and anxiety going up so much, right? What's going on? And, and with this book, for a long time, I'd had a sense that people's ability to focus and pay attention was getting worse. Mm. But for a really long time, I also told myself, look, every generation thinks that, right? You can right. read letters from monks a thousand years ago where they say, oh, our attention ain't what it used to be, right? That's not an exact quote, but that's the gist of it. Right. But, but, I've been wondering about this. I'd wanted to look into the science, but I was, I was wary of it. I thought, you know, is this going to be right? And then there was this sort of precipitating event that happened to me where I thought, oh, you know what? I do need to look into this. I've got a godson Mm. who, uh, when he was nine, he developed this brief, but weirdly intense obsession with Elvis. I never understood how he found out about Elvis, but he started, you know, singing Blue Moon and Viva Las Vegas and Suspicious Minds all the time. And he didn't know that that had become a kind of cheesy style. So he was doing it with a kind of heart catching sincerity. And uh, he kept getting me to tell him the story of Elvis from the beginning. I skipped the bit at the end where he dies on the toilet, obviously. But um, (laughs) and, and what in telling the story of Elvis, I mentioned that he built this palace called Graceland. And one day I was tucking my godson in and he said to me, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. In the way you do with small children when they ask you things. <laughs> like, uh, and he said, no, do you really promise? And I said, yeah, I promise. And I didn't think about it again until 10 years later when a lot of things had really gone wrong. So when, when my godson was, was 15, he dropped out of school. And by the time he was 19, he he just seemed to spend all his time alternating between 
his phone, his iPad and his laptop. And, and his life seemed to be just a blur of like WhatsApp, uh, Snapchat and porn. Uh, and and, and I, it felt like he was fracturing as a person. And, and in that decade in which he had become a man, that was the extreme end of the spectrum, but it felt like that had happened to a lot of people. Mm. That the, It felt like with every year that passed, things that required deep focus, like reading a book, are more and more like running up a down escalator. Some of us still do them, but it seems to be getting harder and harder. Mm. And I was sitting on my sofa with, with my godson and I was looking at him, just flicking between these devices. I was trying to get a conversation going, but it was like his, his mind was sort of almost whirring at the speed of Snapchat like nothing could gain any traction for very long. And, and, I, and, and I could feel that happening to me. It wasn't as extreme in, as it was for me as it was for him. But, and then one day I just thought we had to break this routine. And I said to him, let's go to Graceland, right? He didn't even remember this Elvis obsession, but I was like, no, seriously, let's go to Graceland. Wow. And, and he said, Are you, all right. And so I, I said, I'd take him to the American South, but there was one condition, which is he had to agree that when we were there, he would leave his phone in the hotel, right? Uh -oh. He wouldn't just go around constantly texting and Snapchatting and everything. Uh -oh. And he absolutely promised. So we went there, we went to New Orleans first, but when we arrived at the, Greats of at the gates of Graceland, when you get there, there isn't a physical guide who shows you around anymore. This is even before COVID. What, what happens is they hand you an iPad and you put in headphones and the iPad shows you around. So it says, you know, go left in this room, this happened, go right. Um, and there's in each room there's you're in there's a representation on the on the iPad of that room. Right. So what happens is everyone walks around Graceland just staring at their iPad. So I'm walking around surrounded by these sort of blank, a kind of United Nations of blank faced people, right? Um, and I'm trying to make eye contact with someone to go like, isn't this funny? Like we're the people who travel three thousand miles and we're the ones who actually looked up to see the place we came to, right? And there was one guy who after after been there quite a while, he made eye contact with me. And I was about to say something, and then I realized he'd only looked away from the iPad so he could take out his phone and take a selfie. Wow. Wow. And in the end, me and my godson, we got to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favorite room in the mansion. It was, um, you know, it's kind of lots of fake plants and stuff. Mm. And this couple next to me, this Canadian couple, were there. And the husband turned to his wife and he said, Honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe to the left, you can see the jungle room to the left. Wow. And if you swipe to the right, you can see the jungle room to the right. Wow. And I sort of looked at him and, and the wife's just sitting there swiping back. And I said, but sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do called turning your head because wow. we're actually in the jungle room, right? You don't have to look at a digital representation of it. We're actually there. Right. And, and they looked at me like I was completely mad and hurried out right. of the room. And I turned to my godson who was next to me, actually was just in the corner of the room, but to kind of laugh about it, but he was just looking through Snapchat because from the moment we landed, he'd just broken his promise. He was constantly on his phone and I just really lost it. I was like, you know, you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing you're missing out. Look, none of these people know how to be present with the things that are right in front of them. Mm. Uh, and he stormed off as well. <laughs> and um, I wandered around Graceland on my own. And that night I found him, we were staying in the Heartbreak Hotel, which is just across the street from Graceland. And I found him by the guitar shaped swimming pool and, and he was sitting there looking at his phone and, and I, I kind of realized like a lot of anger, my anger at him was partly anger at myself because um, I could feel these trends bearing on me as well. And, and I remember him just looking at his phone and saying, I know something's really wrong, but I don't know what it is. Mm. And that's when I thought, yeah, I need to investigate this. I need to find out if this is a real crisis, if it is what's causing it. And are, is our attention really getting worse? I think the evidence shows very clearly it is. I can talk you through that. And then most importantly, well, what do we do about it? How do we get our brains back? What is it in you, Johan, because even in your other books, what is it in you that makes you want to chase that down? Because it's, it's beyond journalistic to me when I read your writing. It feels to me um, an empathy, a concern that you have. It's not sociological, journalistic. That's in the mix. But it seems to me that you have this concern it I, I picked that up a lot in the book with your writing and your interviews is that are you aware of that inside you that energy like that you that triggering moment at graceland you thought i've got to chase this down it comes out of a concern to me as you're writing i know you're a journalist in your background but there's huge empathy and humanity in your writing 
Oh, that's really nice of you to say that. I think, I think, I think the honest answer is I grew up in a very violent and mad okay. family and environment. Mm. And obviously that can affect people in all sorts of different ways. Sure. But um, I think some people who grow up in families where through no fault of their own, the adults are not capable of being adults or are not or fully capable of being adults. What it can do is produce people who from a very early age think, I have to build solutions, right? right. And it can make you a very solution oriented person. Right. And it can make you, you know, if, if you don't have adults who can solve problems, look, it can, of course it can have all sorts of effects. I don't want to, and of course I'd much rather not have experienced childhood trauma. It's not, I'm, you know, right. I'm not saying it's sure. a good thing, but I think it, it, partly it can make you solution oriented. Also, it can just make you, how would I put it? Rumi, the 14th century Persian mm. poet, said, yeah. the wound is where the light enters you, mm. uh, which I really love. Mm. And I think what it can do is if you've had an experience of extreme vulnerability or being in danger or not being cared for, I think what it can do is make you very sensitive to other people who are in that situation. Mm. And it can make you it can make you less inclined to just ignore that or yeah uh, clearly it doesn't have that effect on everyone and I don't want to overstate this I've got lots of um uh unappealing parts of my character as well but but I do think I, I think probably that's where it comes from yes definitely comes through in your writing I'm intrigued too about you interview people in person rather than like this sort of phone call obviously that's intentional why is that Lots of people um, say to me, you know, so I, for this book, for example, I traveled all over the world. Right, I interviewed totally. yeah. over 250 of the leading experts in the world about right. tension and focus. And I went from a crazy mixture of people um, and places. I want to go to places, not just experts, although they were extremely important, but, um, you know, just places that have been affected by tension in interesting ways from a favela in, in Rio de Janeiro, mm. where tension had collapsed in a particularly disastrous way to uh, an office in New Zealand where they pioneered a really interesting way that restores people's attention. And I think it's a combination of reasons. Um, and I think it helps to think about during COVID, nobody has said, oh great, another Zoom meeting. <laughs> I, I guarantee no one listening has heard those right. words. Totally. And the truth is, if you interview someone, of course, everyone I interviewed, I could have interviewed over Zoom or right. Skype or whatever, mm. or phone. Um, and the truth is, and all journalists know this, if you interview someone by Zoom, you get about 10% of what you get when you meet the person in the flesh. Wow. Partly because um, you, you're not really meeting them. I'm not saying there's no value to these things, of course. And of course, the pandemic would have been even harder to get through without them. But but absolutely, you you get you get a sense of the person. I I find when I, I mean, there were a few people I interviewed for Zoom for this project. Very few, I would say, maybe ten percent of the two hundred and fifty experts. And the truth is, I can't remember the ones I interviewed over Zoom. Wow. I mean, I can go and read the transcript, and I'm like, oh yeah, they said that. Right. But the ones that I interviewed face to face, I know them. I can picture them. I, can, I have a sensory memory of them and they were much more candid and open with me. Um, wow. So I think it's, it's for all those reasons um, that, that it was, yeah. And, and, and it's almost just very often it's in the silences. It's in the, it's as you're walking out the door, they go, Oh, you know, there's this other thing. You can't leave a silence on Zoom. They just think the Zoom is broken. Right. Very right. often the way you, you, you want people to continue is, um, I mean, a technique is too kind of posh a word for it, but like one, you know, if you ask someone a question and they give you a short answer, if you just carry on looking at them and you carry on nodding, you know, rather like you're doing right now, right. you know, especially in person, they'll just, there's a pressure to carry on talking. If you just leave silences, people will often, not every time, but people often lean in and fill the silence. So for me, that's a really important, and I think, I don't know, maybe this is a wanky, I haven't thought of it this quite this way before, but I think the best way to go on an intellectual journey is to go on a physical journey. Yeah. I think there's something about, because apart from anything else, you know, it took me three years to research this book. 
just like it took me three years for each of my previous books. And there's something about as well. So let's imagine I've done them all on Zoom. I could have interviewed everyone on Zoom in the space of two months, right? But there's also the thinking time of like, oh, so um, I could name anyone from the book, but let's choose a random one, a guy called Professor Marcus Reichel, who um, is an amazing professor in St. Louis, Missouri. So I went to St. Louis, Missouri to interview him. And then from there, if I remember right, I went to Montreal to interview a load of other experts. And even just leaving the interview with him, having a day to wander around St. Louis, then the time to get, get to Montreal, right. all that time I was thinking about him and that interview and processing that interview. Interesting. And in a way that I could have just, you know, shut the interview, you know, click end meeting and then teleport effectively to Montreal. But I wouldn't get that thinking. The thinking time is as important for me as the, and, and we live in, for all the reasons I write about in the book, we live in a culture that is chronically depriving people of thinking time mm -hmm. and space to think. Mm -hmm. And actually just on a journey, there's just inevitably space to think, right? There's more than there is if I just stayed at home. I was saying the other day to my online mentorship tribe around the world that I speak to on Zoom twice a month, I was speaking to them about the decline of servant leadership in our world and trying to speak about that term, that idea, and that I think the world is shifting globally from you know, self-serving leadership to servant leadership, though it's not a mainstream term now, I know. And one of the things I was aware of is that one of the reasons why I think that has declined is because, as you say, as a baby boomer, I'm 64, I grew up in proper community, a bit like your Swiss childhood experiences, where we were kind of all raising each other's kids. Any parent could clip anybody's kid around the ear. They'd all be in jail now. But back then, <laughs> it would, my mother would thank people for clipping me around the ear. Even the local copper could do that. And then the guy at the local store gave my parents, you know, stuff on tick or on the slate, as we say in England. He also entered into the economy of community and did the best he could. And then, um, you know, the cup of sugar metaphor, literally that's what we did as kids. I remember all of us, my siblings going around borrowing stuff and people borrowing stuff from us. Something about that face-to-face -face communal physical involvement that you speak about a lot, I know, in Lost Connections. I grew up in that. And of course, I realized my kids and my grandkids, I've got eight grandkids, are not growing up in that and can't find it anywhere. So the face-to-face -face thing that you talk about, I completely get that. I, 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 as you describe it to me, I'm thinking, yeah, the awareness that you're having a face-to-face -face, uh, is more than just the time you're with that person. It's on your mind during, before, during, and after, in the way you say. The thing you're describing, I think you're so right, the thing you're describing uh, has all sorts of effects, but but one is um, relates to children's ability to pay attention. Right. So for every child who was diagnosed with attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children right. diagnosed with attention problems. And there's been this huge rise in children struggling to pay attention at exactly the same time, I think not by coincidence, that childhood has been radically transformed. Mm. So, and I think there's, there's, evidence for five factors in this transformation of childhood that are that are severely harming children's ability to develop focus and attention i tell the so you're absolutely right that experience you have so 10 percent of children now ever play outdoors without adult supervision 10 percent, and, and that 10 percent, the average time they spend outdoors i think is something like 12 minutes a week so wow. childhood has gone from being something that happened out in the open right then happens almost entirely behind closed doors or under right. adult supervision. And in the book, I tell the story of an amazing woman called Lenore Skenazi, who, so Lenore, Lenore was a kid in a suburb of Chicago in, in the early 1960s. And when she was five years old, she would leave her house on her own and walk to school, which was 15 minutes away. She'd just catch up with her friends on the way there. When they got to the school, there was a 10 year old boy whose job was to be the lollipop man to walk the smaller kids across the road. Oh. She would go into the school, then she would leave school on her own uh, and wander around the neighborhood for a few hours. Kids would just spontaneously invent games. Sometimes they'd play ball games. Sometimes they'd invent their own games. And then she'd make her, make her way home for five or six o'clock when she was hungry. That was how everyone's childhood was in the early 1960s. Right. Not so long ago. That's what my parents' childhood was like. Right. That was what human childhood had always been like with a handful of exceptions like 
plantation slavery, monstrous right. exceptions. Um, that was childhood. By the time Lenore, by the time you got to the 1990s and Lenore had her own kids, childhood had been completely transformed, right? No one let their children play outdoors. Wow. And Lenore got involved in this controversy because, so one day she took her son Izzy when he was nine on holiday to Mexico and they were in a resort. And for the first time, and she noticed that he would just run down every morning and the kids would meet up, meet up with other kids in the resort and they would just play spontaneously all day. And her son, it was the first time she didn't have to jolt her son out of bed in the morning. He would just, and she suddenly realized for, for the first time he was getting a taste of what she got for her entire childhood. When he came, when they came back to New York, Lenore, uh, her son wanted a little bit of independence. So one day he suggested to his mum that, that they lived in Queens, suggested that his mother take him to Bloomingdale's, which is in Manhattan, and leave him there and he could find his own way home. Right. So they sat on the floor with a map and they planned it all out and, and, and she did it. And, she, and it was a catch in her heart as she left him. Right. And an hour later, he came home all sweaty and happy and, you know, feeling really grown up. And she thought, oh, this is a great thing. So she wrote, she was a journalist. She wrote an article saying, what a great, you know, other parents might want to consider doing this. And what happened to Lenore next was insane. So she was described by several newspapers and TV shows as the worst mother in America. Wow. She was put on TV shows where she was next to a parent whose child had been murdered as if those were equally likely scenarios that your child would be murdered and your child would be able to get the subway, you know, a few stops from Bloomingdale's. Mm. Um, but it led to actually this incredible experience for Lenore because she realized, well, what happened to the culture? Because all these people saying she was America's worst mother had themselves experienced the kind of childhood she had experienced. Right. She's like, what happened to parenthood? And it's not that the world got more dangerous. Murder rates massively fell during that time. Mm, they fell for adults and children. And um, today, your child is three times more likely to be hit by lightning than to be killed by a stranger. So wow. she's like, well, what's what's going on here, right? Um, and she began, she set up an amazing group called Let Grow, which is about restoring childhood and children's ability to play. But the reason why I tell this story in my book about attentions is what I learned is there's scientific evidence for 12 different factors that are causing this attention crisis that have got us to the point where the average American college student now focuses on any one task for 65 seconds and the average office worker now focuses for only three minutes. Wow. And one of those factors is the physical and psychological confinement of our children, which is causing, it's partly to do with the way our school system runs, which is terrible and harming attention. We can right. talk about that. But this factor you've raised, which is a really important one, there are loads of ways in which it damages attention. The first is really basic and obvious, exercise. Right. When you, kids get to run around, which they naturally want to do, it causes their brain to grow bigger and to have more neurons. Mm. We physically prevent children from exercising, right? The, the second is the skills that children learn in play. Mm. So think about when Lenore was in that neighborhood, just wandering around at the age of five and from then on. What's she learning when she plays with the other kids? She's learning how to make things happen, right? Mm. You have to suggest a game that the other kids go along. She's learning how to persuade the other children. Um, she's learning how to cope with disappointment. Sometimes the kids don't want to play the game you suggest. Sometimes you're going to lose the game. Right. She's learning a whole... Re these are And these are not incidental skills. As Dr. Isabel Benke, the Chilean expert on play, put it to me, you learn how to learn in play, mm. right? This, is, this isn't some... some additional add-on this is how we learn to learn everything else we learn is built on this baseline of what children learn when they're playing the third factor is it helps you to cope with anxiety um, kids who don't get to play are much more anxious because they they're not they haven't learned that experience of oh if i try that it won't work okay i'll cope with disappointment this way and that right. the fourth is that children learn what they're what they're inherently interested in by running around and playing you know some kids learn that they're the class joker some kids learn that they're good at football some kids learn that they're you know like little science experiments whatever it is but if you're deprived of play if you're managed all the time you don't get to do those things you don't get to find out what you're good at and it's when you discover meaning that you can begin to pay attention mm -hmm. things meaningful to you you can pay attention to it and we've stripped all these things out of children's lives right and that's a key reason why our children are really struggling to focus and pay attention. Because this, this common phrase now of on the spectrum seems to be what we're using about 
lots of these kids, which may or may not be a valid diagnosis, it may be much more to do with what you're talking about in the book, that their focus has been stolen and hijacked rather than there's some autistic trait that needs to be diagnosed. And the moment they're given that label and that paraphernalia kicks in, it kind of begins to set a precedent for the trajectory of their lives. It may be much more to do with what you're talking about, don't you think? Yeah, so it's important to stress that autism is a real thing and can be a huge strength, uh, as well as causing some drawbacks. But but I think you're absolutely right. What we what we've started doing with children is we profoundly pathologize difference, right? Yeah. And all we even all we pathologize perfectly normal reactions, right? Mm. Seventy three only seventy three percent of elementary schools in the United States have any kind of recess or what we call playtime, right? Now those kids aren't malfunctioning when they want to run around right. what's crazy is our system is malfunctioning because we we act like it's normal to get a child who's six years old to sit still for eight hours a day that's the crazy hand. three hand system yeah <laughs> exactly that's the 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 lunacy in it yes. and i think you're right that there's you know i don't want to take this analogy too far but there's a guy i interviewed uh, really made me think about this um it's called Professor Nicholas Dobman, and he's a veterinary, professor of veterinary science at Tufts University. And one day, about 20 years ago, an owner of a dog came to see him because he also does consultant, veterinary consulting. The dog was called Eagle, um, I'm sorry, Emma, she was a beagle. And the owner said, I've got a real problem. Uh, my dog won't pay attention to anything. My dog runs around all the time, and my dog barks a lot. Um, what can I do? So initially, um, Professor Dobman assigned the the owner and the dog to a training class, but the, but it didn't make much difference. It was a little bit, but not much. So at that point, um, for Professor Dobman, you're going to think I'm joking about this. I'm not. Diagnosed the dog with ADHD. Wow. And prescribed Ritalin for the dog. At which point, um, a few months later, the owner comes back and says, "It's great. My dog doesn't bark anymore. My dog's." doesn't run around all the time wow. and and Nicholas Dobman is um, a pioneer of uh, he's been called the the Pied Piper of drugging animals so he's been a huge pioneer of the extension of what used to be thought of as human psychiatric concepts to animals so he is it, partly due to his pioneering work that half of all zoos in the United States now admit that they drug their animals. Uh, for example, there was a polar bear called Snowball who used to pace all the time. And um, Professor Dobman pioneered just giving the, the polar bear massive, massive amounts of Ritalin and Prozac. And the polar bear stopped pacing all the time. And when I went to see Professor Dobman, I thought ahead of time, he would say to me about w- what he calls animal ADHD, a lot of what people say about human ADHD, I thought you'd say, oh, this is just a genetic problem and so on. Right. Actually, to be fair to him, he was much more, he had a much more sophisticated way of thinking about it. He said, I said, Emma the Beagle, do you think you've solved that problem? Do you think you've solved the problem for Snowball the polar bear? He said, of course not. The polar bear in the wild spends all day right. roaming around. They walk right. dozens and dozens of miles. A dog is meant to have two hours off leash every day, at least, oh. right? Mm. These animals don't get that. Mm. He said, of course, I'm dealing with a, a phenomenon that is a product of captivity, right? Mm. It's not some underlying, you know, biological problem. Um, and, and I was really, I thought it was really interesting because I started to ask myself, well, he used this phrase, which is a lot of these animals have frustrated biological needs, mm. right? Um, so for example, he told me about another dog that was a sort of ADHD dog in inverted commas that lived in a tiny apartment in Manhattan, ran around all the time, chased its own tail, and then was sent to live on a farm. And mysteriously enough, the ADHD disappeared when it could run around oh. a farm. Oh. So I started asking myself how much of the pathologization of children's attention problems now is analogous to Emma the Beagle. Not all of it is. There are some people who, um, as a result of their biological makeup, are somewhat more likely to have attention problems than others. Mm. Um so you don't want to entirely, it's not entirely a result of the environment or not purely in a result of the environment. But I think you can see very clearly that a lot of this is a response to the crazy way we expect children to live. And there's a wonderful doctor called Sammy Tamimi in Lincoln here in Britain. Very moving. He's a child psychiatrist. 
and he took over a practice in Lincoln, maybe uh, when did Sammy start? 15 years ago. And he took over 27 kids who had been diagnosed with ADHD and were being get, drugged with Ritalin, the, which is a very powerful stimulant drug. And I remember him describing to me a few of his cases. There was a boy called Michael who was 11. So when he overtakes over these 27 cases, he interviews all the kids, right? And their parents to sort of see if they should continue or whether he should pursue other solutions. This boy called Michael, what happened is he was playing up at school. That's not his real name, obviously. He was playing up at school. He was kicking off. He was refusing to pay attention. And Sammy asked Michael and his mother, well, when did this begin? Was anything happening in his life at that point? Mm. It turned out that's the point at which his dad had left the family and not even spoken to his son. Mm. So when Sammy's interviewing, he's thinking, oh, maybe, maybe this is, maybe that's a factor, right? It seems fairly obvious. So Sammy phoned Michael's dad and explained to him the problems that his son was having. And the dad was quite shamefaced. He came in to see Sammy and he agreed to start seeing his son once a week. Within a few months of seeing his dad once a week, they began to wean him off these attention, these very powerful stimulant drugs, and Michael was fine, right? He, he didn't have some innate biological problem. He missed his dad, and he, and, and he blamed himself for his dad going away. Right. Now, that's not going to be true for every child with attention problems, clearly, but it is going to be true for a lot of them. And so I think we need to think, and there are more importantly, there are lots of doctors and scientists who think we need to think about this, but we've been thinking in a very simplistic way about children's attention problems. We've also been thinking different, in a different but very simplistic way about our own attention problems. And I think we need to think in a much more sophisticated way. Hey, thanks for being here today. Thanks for listening or watching this conversation with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment if you did. Let's stay connected. Maybe you don't subscribe and you'd like to do that. Just hit the subscribe button and make that happen. Help me spread the word. If you think this uh, podcast channel would be of interest to other people in your world, maybe help me put the word out and let people know if you feel it would add value to their world. Again, a huge thank you to you all for being here. This conversation, as you just heard and saw, was about focus and attention, two things I highly value you giving in my direction. So thanks again for being here. Speak to you all soon. Thank you.